Well, good morning. Oh, that was a little louder than I'd expected. Good to be with you today. Good to see you here. Uh, yesterday, Diane and I were out for a bike ride. And uh, who did we bump into but uh, the McKenzie's? And so we were able to catch up with them on all things grandchild. And they informed us that uh, they wouldn't be in church today, mainly because Bob had to preach today at First Nazarene Church. So that's where they are. And uh, Bob's representing the work of Shalom Counseling Center. Well, we're continuing our series on Acts, the sequel. And this is our second Sunday. And uh, today we come to a rather interesting, if not odd, story called Picking a Replacement. At least that's what I'm calling it. And it's found in Acts 1, verses 12 to 26. And in just a few moments, we'll read that together. Well, as you all know, the UK is currently in a period of national mourning. It runs until the day of Queen Elizabeth's funeral, which is tomorrow. I'm sure many prayers have gone up the past while. Prayers of gratitude for the Queen's seven-decade reign. Some mourners, did you know, have waited 24 hours to pay their respects. And there have been prayers of consolation as well. I wonder if a lot of Canadians were surprised at how moved they were at the Queen's passing. But what do you expect? Monarchy is in our blood, right? If you're like me, love of queen was instilled from an early age. In grade school, we sang God save the queen every day. How could it not be in your blood? While we could wish all our praying was done in happy, hopeful circumstances, that isn't how life plays out. Sometimes we find ourselves praying in less than happy times. And that's where the early church was in Acts chapter 1. Jesus, who had been crucified, was resurrected. And for 40 days, they enjoyed having him back, sharing meals, teaching, discussing the scriptures together. It was like old times. But then he was taken up into heaven. Ouch. No one was ready for that. He was gone. What's next? Always a good question in the book of Acts. Well, to answer this question, Luke describes two episodes which taken together reveal how the church dealt with yet another pressing problem. So let's read the passage from Acts 1, beginning at verse 12. I'm reading from the NIV 11. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and shared in our ministry. Verse 18. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Oh, did I mention this was PG-13, at least? Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Verse 20. For said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. 
Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's Baptist to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Verse 23. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Well, what do you make of all that? Well, the first of these occasions introduced a problem while the second showed how they addressed the problem. One, a conspicuous absence, verses 12 to 14. After Jesus' ascension, the apostles returned to Jerusalem, verse 12, and there they convened along with some others, verse 13, and what especially stands out in the, is the list of apostles who were present. Luke lists them. One at a time. We just blast over them. We just run right past them. But he took his time and he listed them one by one. In the translation, the message, don't know if anybody has that with you today. Each name in the list is given its own separate line. And double spaced. So it takes up a whole lot of area on the page, something publishers don't like to do. But there it is, name after name, with room to breathe above them, after them, and below them. I think it's for dramatic effect, not to put us asleep. Whenever the chapel elders have a meeting, somebody takes minutes. And the minutes of our last meeting began, and I'm sure you'll note the drama, attendees, Walter, Terry, Jared, Fred. That's who's there. Well, who was at this meeting in Luke 1? Luke lists 11 names. The, these are the apostles. Why just 11? I thought there were 12. Well, there were, but one, well, uh, he was absent. Why? It's interesting, Luke's Gospel, Volume 1, doesn't say. But Acts, Volume 2, does offer us some clues. Judas is conspicuous, and his name isn't even mentioned. How can he be conspicuous? He's conspicuous by his absence, right? Let's suppose this morning our worship team decided to sleep in. Do you think we'd notice them? You think we'd notice it? Oh, yeah, we would notice it. The countdown clock would get to zero, and then nothing would happen, and they would all, each and every one of them, would be conspicuous by their absence. So was Judas. And it says this group of apostles and others were praying. And the question that comes to my mind is, what were they saying? What were they praying about? I'd love to have been a fly on the wall at that prayer meeting, wouldn't you? After all that had happened, after all that had been said and done, what were they saying? What were they praying about? Well, as the writers of scriptures sometimes do, they don't tell us. He just kind of leaves it for us to imagine, perhaps. But what the early church did about it about Judas' absence, is the focus of the next occasion. So that was occasion one. And then we come to occasion two. Because the apostles were down to 11, it was decided that they would rectify the problem. Which brings us to two, choosing a successor, 15 to 26. We had a conspicuous absence, and now we have choosing a successor. That makes sense. So on this occasion, Peter, in verse 15, offered some commentary on Judas. And you would think, well, if he's going to do that, he would have to go back to what? Uh, you know, some of the stories from the life of Jesus. No, that's not what he does. He goes back to the Old Testament. 
he sees Judas in some passages in the Old Testament. And so he takes us there. He reviews the Judas story. Judas' betrayal of Jesus, whatever else it was, Peter tells us was the outworking of the plan of God. Verses 16 to 17. Well, you say, that's funny. I've read the Old Testament twice, and I never saw Judas there. Well, pay attention this morning. Was Judas' betrayal a moral failure? Yes. Was it part of a larger plan? Yes. According to King David, writing in Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, Judas' treacherous act of betraying our Lord was both. Remember last week we noted that a major theme in Luke and Acts is that God has a plan. And when you have a plan, you know what you got to do with the plan. You got to work the plan. And God's plan, he's been working it out through history and Luke's view of the story of Jesus is that all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, is somehow part of the plan. And he's going to show us today how one of those episodes was, or at least allude to it. As tragic as Judas' betrayal of Jesus, Jesus was, ah, hard, this is easy to say, but it's hard to understand. As tragic as Judas' betrayal of Jesus was, in God's hand, it became part of a seamless series of events leading to salvation. Now, I can tell you that explaining it is a little more difficult. In God's hands, it became part of a seamless series of events leading to our salvation. That's why Luke can say that Judah's dastardly deed was foretold. And he sees it in the two Psalm passages. Further, verses 18 and 19, Peter says that G Judas' death was ironic and horrific. I'll dwell briefly on the ironic and briefer still on the horrific. It was ironic in that money he made betraying his master ended up being used to purchase his own cemetery plot. You see the irony in that? He wasn't expecting that. His own ill-gotten gain bought land that became known as Field of Blood, or as Eugene Peterson puts it in the message, murder meadow. Murder meadow. How would you like to build your house on a field that was called murder meadow? Where are you guys living these days? Oh, we're just over the hill around the corner at a place called murder meadow. Murder meadow. That's just not that inviting, is it? Of course, it was also horrific, and I won't dwell on Luke's description I think it pretty much speaks for itself. Finally, what happened to Judas was a fulfillment of divine justice. Verse 20. In the two Psalms cited, David calls on God to punish his enemies. His petitions are blunt, as they often are in the Old Testament. When in Psalm 69, he says, May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. He's wishing that his enemies would get what they deserve. Namely, homelessness in this case. You ever prayed a prayer like that? Wow. His description of derelict dwellings reminds me of a community with abandoned homes. Uh, Diane and I have sometimes spent parts of our summer in Coleman, Alberta, in the Crow's Nest Pass. And in parts of that community, there are derelict buildings. One is a school, another is a home, maybe a business. They look awful. Who would wish that on anyone? Well, apparently the psalmist, and Luke implies a similar sentiment, judgment on Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. You find that sobering? Yeah. Well, in Psalm 109.8, David says, May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. Here he's wishing his enemies the opposite of a long and happy life. He's wishing them a rather abbreviated life. And after David's enemies are dead and gone, that someone else would have to take their leadership position. So it was in Judas' case. Now, I know these psalms are difficult for us to read. Who prays prayers like that? 
I seldom have. Perhaps during the early days of the Ukraine invasion, we found prayers like that not far from our tongues. But as a rule, we don't pray like that. It sounds so unchristian, doesn't it? But we have to remember that these prayers are not the rants of crazy vigilantes, but rather they are prayers of the godly referring their enemies to God. You guys are doing bad. You are hurting the people of God. And I can't deal with you, and I won't deal with you, but I'm going to refer you to God, the great judge of the world, and I'll let him deal with you. He refers his enemies to God and his justice. The psalmist won't take matters into his own hands. He hands them over to God. Well, these prayers are here viewed as prophecies, which under the guidance of God came to pass. Judas lost his land, he lost his life, and he lost his place of leadership. Betraying the Christ cost him dearly. Yet amazingly, these events were incorporated into what God was doing. Judas' life somehow accentuates the unthwartableness of God's plan to work out so sweet a salvation. Nothing could stop God's plan, not even a Judas. Tragic story that it is. Well, having reviewed the Judas story, Peter now outlines the process they followed in order to replace Judas. All other things being equal, such as character and reputation, Judas' replacement needed to have been part of the fellowship, the fellowship of those who had been with Jesus. He had to have known Jesus and to have been known by Jesus. And this was what he would bear witness to, the living Lord. And now he was alive, and this same new life would be offered to all who turned to him. Well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So two suitable candidates were selected, Joseph and Matthias. As you know, prayers were offered. Lots were cast. We'll get to that in a moment. And the results were regarded as the person that God had chosen for that role. Now, we don't much use lots these days. I can't remember the last elders meeting I was at where we had to make a tough decision. And we said, now it is time to haul out those lots. How did they work? One commentator suggests that names may have been put on one stone each, placed in a cloth bag, and the first name drawn out got the job. To our modern ears, it sounds a lot like fate, doesn't it? Sounds like rolling the dice. In fact, one of our major translations, the New Living Translation, actually reads it like that. Psalm 1633 says, we may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. And that's kind of their way of, you know, blending together this notion of Man has a part, God has a part. What we tend to think of as random, the biblical writers viewed as redemptive and under God's control. Which raises an interesting question. Actually, it raises a lot of interesting questions. If the Bible is our guide in matters of faith and practice, should we use lots for making decisions? Should we use lots for making decisions? <laughs> Bob's not liking that idea. Did you know that some traditions still do? In November of 2012, the Coptic Orthodox Church chose their next pope, Theodorus II of Alexandria. Here's how they made their final decision. The ceremony to choose the Pope from three candidates was held at Cairo's St. Mark's Cathedral. Prior to the selection, acting Pope Pachamios sealed the chalice with the names with red wax and put it upon the altar as he led Mass. 
He then told the congregation, we will pray that God will choose the good shepherd. Following a moment of silence, a blindfolded six-year-old boy then picked Theodorus' name from the chalice. And he became their next leader. What do you think? <laughs> Some of you are thinking, that's good. In Acts, is the author simply reporting on what they did? Or is he also conveying a directive, namely, and later generations should do this too? You ever wondered about that in the book of Acts? How much of this is, you know, just history? This is what they did. And how much of this is counsel? And this is what you guys ought to do too. Are all the practices recorded in the New Testament to be followed by the modern day church? Or is there room for some flexibility here? What do you think, Bob? <laughs> well, on that happy note, I'd like to end my message. I vote for some flexibility. I don't know about you. We'll come back to that briefly in our uh, questions at the end. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, ever since the Lord Jesus left and returned to heaven, he's continued working among us. We're thankful his presence remains. We need him more than ever. Help us live for him. Make us discerning and wise as we face challenges. Amen. Well, in this week's Advocate was a story of profound generosity. Did you read it? A 76-year-old woman in central Alberta was given special recognition for blood donations totaling 203. I don't know about you, but my numbers aren't quite that good. Apparently, the Guinness World Book of Records will be recognizing her. I certainly wouldn't want to rain on her parade, but... I would have to say that the efforts of Jesus Christ are far greater. Thanks to his sacrifice 2,000 years ago, countless millions have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What you've done is marvelous. We believe in it. Receive our thanks. Amen. And so this morning as we break bread, let's remember him who bore our sins in his body. Let's take and eat. And then as we drink the cup, let's remember him who shed his blood for us. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Well, we always like to give you a little bit of homework so that you can go home and finish the message. If you think, well, he didn't quite tie that up the way I had hoped he would, no, we'd like you to do that uh, together with maybe some people around your dinner table today or some other spot. First question, why do you think Judas betrayed Jesus? 
Well, think about that. Think about that deeply. Why do you think Judas betrayed Jesus? Secondly, today we noted how on one occasion the early church selected new leaders. How is our approach at Balmoral similar or dissimilar? You say, I'm not sure. How do, we, how do we do it again at Balmoral? Well, you should know that by now, but if you've forgotten, speak to one of the elders or deacons. And then finally, as you're reading through Acts, just finished reading through Acts again as part of this series. It's only 28 chapters long, you know. As you're reading through Acts, list practices of the early church. How much modification of these should we allow? Should we entertain? There's lots of practices. What do you want to do with this? Encourage you to think about that. Well, our benediction today comes from Jude chapter 2. Please remain seated. May mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. May mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Go in peace.